Welcome to The Gary Null Show, a program designed to enhance mental, physical, and spiritual well-being through science and the wisdom of the ages. Let us take you on a journey of empowerment. Sit back, relax, and get ready to change your life for good. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Nolan. I'd like to welcome you to the program. We talk about health and nutrition. Sometimes we're in the studio, sometimes we go all over the world to bring you the people who are making a difference in our health. Well, as you can see, we're not in the studio. We're out here talking with people who are experts in the area of allergies. Let's see what they have to say about, you didn't even know your depression could have been caused by an allergy, you're overweight by an allergy, you're candida by an allergy. You'll find all this out today. Join me now for Allergies, A Natural Approach. Often when we have childhood allergies, these tend to go away. The body finds other ways of adapting to these subtle kinds of reactions. When we're children, we're more sensitive, and these hyper-reactions of the immune system and the way we release histamine and other chemicals in the body that causes the common symptoms of allergies, such as uh, swelling, redness, uh, itchiness, and uh, watery or mucus discharge. These can pass, but we may still manifest them later in terms of other uh, imbalance and as we uh, experience more stress in our life or we're exposed to more chemicals or we develop other habits such as the, the regular intake of sugar uh, or we start smoking cigarettes or we use alcohol regularly or caffeine these tend to weaken the body's immune system and then we become more sensitive again or our bodies tends to become more reactive we start to stress uh, our body stress our adrenal glands which help us deal with, with uh, everyday life and stress and and we start to have again allergic reactions and these may manifest on the skin in the way our brain functions and in our our moods and energy as well as uh, the common sinus allergies our diet has has changed an awful lot in the last 50 years where we've uh, restricted the number of foods we're, we're eating we've over processed our foods we've chemicalized our foods uh, uh, in fact, we're malnourished, and I think that plays a real strong uh, role in the uh, al epidemic of allergy. Usually it has to do with the overload of the detox pathways. Nutritional deficiencies are the thing that allow the body to become hypersensitive. We become nutritionally deficient due to minerals that are lacking within our diet. Um, our industrialized state that we're in, an overload of toxins in the environment, in our food, in our air, in our water, the lack of nutrition in our denatured foods, lack of minerals in our denatured foods. Minerals are what has been called the catalysts to life. Without minerals, we don't live. Senate document number 264 stated very clearly that minerals give us our immunity from disease and also help us to repair from disease should we fall ill. They also stated in that document that the American people have been deficient in minerals for many years because we have farmed the minerals out of our soil. So the foods that we're growing no longer contain the full range of all the minerals that we require to maintain our health. The tomato that you buy commercially has 75% less nutrition in it than a tomato you might grow in your own backyard. Most of the foods that we purchase today are denatured in that they are overly processed and the essential fats are removed and artificial fats are placed in. These artificial saturated fats, hydrogenated oils, block certain pathways adding to the allergic response of the patient. 
And one of the areas of great interest is the phenomenon called the leaky gut syndrome. The leaky gut is just like it sounds, is that for a variety of reasons, poor diet, exposure to alcohol, exposure to antibiotics, uh, infections in the digestive tract, you go down a long list, the lining of the digestive tract stops functioning as a barrier and starts allowing in partially digested food, toxins from bacteria and other microbes in the digestive tracts, chemicals that normally would never allow to be in. And so it overloads the immune system. When people are either potentially or uh, have some inherent capacity for allergies and they develop an infection uh, of any kind, and this is common in, in people with asthma or hay fever, when they get low-grade infections in the respiratory tract, their allergy symptoms are enhanced. Also, I find, and it's, it's pretty well studied, that certain worms, uh, intestinal parasites and amoebas, can stimulate an allergic reaction in the body and all of a sudden cause allergies, uh, both classical kinds of allergy symptoms like uh, sinus allergies and other, and other more subtle ones like mood swings and energy level changes. From our experience, we found that 85% of most people's allergies come from wheat and from milk. So just from a simple understanding, if 85% of most allergies come from that substances, that it would be a good idea to maybe eliminate those substances or cut way back on those. I would say the food, probably my favorite foods are the ones that would give me the problems because those were the foods that I was constantly eating. Um, basically coffee, milk, uh, wheat, um, eggs, um, just all the regular staples of my diet. In a natural way of thinking about allergies is those foods that we crave the most or that we have to have or that we couldn't live without or those substances that we're most attracted to are likely the culprits that could be causing problems. These could be milk products, they could be sugar, they could be uh, refined flour products, they could be crackers, they could be caffeine. So the first level of working on your own allergies is to look at the three things that you like the most and eat and use most often and take a month and get those out of your diet and see how you feel. If you're going to be eating animal pr protein, it should be extremely lean. Fat is a great storage site for uh, antibiotics and hormones and uh, dioxin and PZBs and all kinds of chemical pollutants. And you get that if you're eating a lot of animal products with a lot of animal fats. You cannot drink alcohol and be food allergy free, even for those of you who are trying to get your antioxidants from red wine. Uh, it makes you prone to developing allergy, it creates a leaky gut. You cannot treat chronic pain with aspirin and aspirin substitutes like ibuprofen and clenorrhil and feldine and uh, more powerful anti-inflammatories. Why? Because it causes a leaky gut. You can't treat every infection that comes down the pike with antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics indirectly by causing overgrowth in the digestive tract uh, create a leaky gut uh, and so forth and so on. You should concentrate first on eliminating the toxins in the diet, then concentrate on your choices of foods. And when you've gone that far, the next step is to eliminate also the nightshades. The nightshades have a certain chemical in them that can accumulate in the body and affect some arthritic patients. So the nightshades are, to are tomato, potato, peppers, cayenne, tobacco. It's very important for people to know that. Um, tobacco is one of those allergic, addictive substances as well. And it does have a chemical that accumulates in the body. So far as chemicals are concerned, people are frequently allergic to natural gas, gasoline and propane, uh, chlorine. Uh, many of our patients have difficulty taking baths or showers because of the chlorine content of the water and they have to have a water filter to help them. Uh, perfumes, any kind of scent and scented products, whether it's perfumes or scented detergents, scented bath soap, um, or even clothes washing soap, tend to be the common chemical allergens. Um, people tend to be allergic to grass pollen, weed pollen, tree pollen, as well as mold and animal danders, whether it's cat hair, dog hair, um, feathers from birds, uh, and of course mold. There are over, uh, there's probably 3,000 species of mold in the world. Uh, some are pathogenic and some are not, uh, but people tend to be allergic to these. 
and this is an allergy which is present year-round. Dust and molds and pollen can cause much more than hay fever, asthma, and eczema. Ch some children become suicidal every year at the same time when uh, a certain pollen is in the air. They'll become suicidal on rainy days because of mold. We weren't taught about this when I studied allergy and immunology, and I can tell you this exists. Why it isn't accepted, I really don't know. Cerebral allergies are relatively common. I see in my practice often people who come in and have uh, problems concentrating. And I think a lot of this comes from the digestive tract and an imbalance in gastrointestinal function. Uh, currently, the ability to evaluate the function of the environment and the way the body handles and digests and assimilates foods has really been a, a great benefit in, in my practice and, those, uh, and the practices of many doctors around the country evaluating whether there's overgrowth of yeast or parasites and whether there's adequate levels of hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes to help uh, digest the foods completely. When we don't digest properly or we have these organisms that tend to ferment and create other toxins in the body and get absorbed into the bloodstream, then this, these can affect the way the brain functions. When we think of allergens, we generally think of common allergies like a milk allergy. But what about allergens that cause us to be overweight, or cause PMS to exacerbate, or cause sleep disorders, or even cause alcoholism? What isn't spoken about that is very important are the brain allergies. Those very good example of a brain allergy is the alcoholic. Those kind of allergies elicit mood swings, and a person will crave the allergy. They feel better when they have the food. Sugar is one of those things that happen to be a brain allergy. Sugar follows the same biochemical pathway as ethyl alcohol. So there are those of you out there that are addicted to your cookie and your cake and your refined sugars in the diet. You feel better when you have it. When you try to do without it, you feel worse. And you sometimes go through withdrawal symptoms. It's very difficult to try to get patients off sugar, refined sugars, because of that reason they become addicted to the particular substance. The question between alcohol and allergy is now looks like it is more and more related. About 76% uh, about of people with alcoholism uh, appear to have a genetic component that, that makes them more susceptible. About 20% of the people are born allergic. Uh, which is a sort of a genetic type transformation, that susceptibility. As a solo practitioner in private practice, I see many patients for a variety of conditions, including alcohol excess. When testing these patients, I often find that the type of alcohol which they crave and tend to indulge in may be actually allergic. For example, a person who prefers vodka is commonly allergic to potato. A person who has a lot of um, wine as part of their alcoholism is commonly allergic to yeast and grape. Uh, so this got to me thinking that the alcohol aspect is partly allergic in nature just from my day-to-day -day experience. Now beyond that, I also test every patient for potential of hypoglycemic state. And invariably, persons with alcohol uh, problems test that they have a hypoglycemic tendency, which is that they're Blood glucose level is unstable, and it tends to vary both up and down, but especially falls rapidly. And at that point, they're in a hypoglycemic state. In that state, the brain is not fueled properly. It is not getting its glucose as its fuel, and is very, very off balance. And for some reason, alcohol seems to give people some relief in that situation. The brain is only 3% of the body weight, but it burns up 25% of the body's energy and it utilizes that because it's a very high energy operation. It's always going uh, and, and replacing things and doing work, even while sleeping. So the brain then gets the alcohol, and the alcohol is toxic to the brain. And then in addition to that, the alcohol causes injury to the intestinal tract, which the person doesn't absorb the right types of uh, food, loses appetite, and also uh, winds up eating about uh, eating junk food, and about 60% of the calories in, are coming from uh, alcohol, which has virtually no 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 nutrients in it. 
So the brain then gets malnourished. So you have a malnourished, toxic brain that ceases to work properly. Weight problems are very interesting. People don't realize that uh, overweight people are not really suffering from a lack of willpower. It's not a willpower issue at all. The body is actually really telling them that it needs something that they're not getting from the food they're eating. Now mostly what's lacking in our food supply today is the minerals and it is really surprising how quickly after a person starts using the colloidal minerals, getting the full range of all the minerals that were previously lacking from their diet, they find that their cravings, their constant gnawing cravings for sweets and other junk foods or snack foods actually disappears. Another common symptom that may have a contribution of allergy is premenstrual syndrome or PMS in women. Uh, swelling, irritability, depression, uh, and, and food allergies are not uncommon in this situation. If I have women and I have them get off sugar and alcohol and cow's milk and wheat as a trial, oftentimes in a month or two, their menstrual symptoms are much less. A lot of people have problems sleeping. Uh, I strongly advise that if a person is having difficulty falling asleep or waking up frequently during the night or waking up extremely early in the morning, and especially if you're tired during the day, that's an extremely unhealthy practice. Uh, nutrition and lifestyle plays a real important role, and it may be that you cannot detoxify if you're suffering from sleeping disorders. Uh, so restful sleep with its release of uh, melatonin and growth hormone uh, may play a real important role in the functioning of the immune system and the ability to, det to detoxify. We now believe that attention deficit disorder is directly related in a high percentage of those suffering from it from cerebral allergies. Dr. Doris Rapp, leading pediatrician and allergist, has been investigating the role between attention deficit disorder and allergens. The estimates are that there may be as many as 8 million children who have this problem by the year 2000. Now if you go back about 40, 50, 60 years ago, once in a while you'd have a hyperactive child in the classroom. But somebody has to sit back and say, why are so many children hyperactive? If you go back just two or three years, you'll find that the school nurses might be giving Ritalin to one or two children. Now they're giving, in some schools, to as many as 60 at lunchtime. What are we doing wrong? I think what we're doing wrong is this. We have managed to pollute our air, our food, our water, our homes, our schools, our workplaces, and our clothing, and we can't continue to do it. In the last 10 years practicing pediatrics, I have seen a sharp increase in the number of children that come to my office uh, with the diagnosis already made of attention deficit disorder and sometimes with the diagnosis of hyperactivity of a combination of both. We believe through our research with writing our book ADD, The Natural Approach, that ADD is actually believably overdiagnosed, overprescribed. It is an easier, simpler way for the families to work with the children that have a behavior problem as opposed to going with the long term, which can be sufficiently worked through nutrition and also through family counseling. Let me talk for a minute about how do you recognize if your child who's been labeled ADD really has an environmental illness? Well, first of all, there are physical clues. Their ears get red. Their cheeks are too red. They have wiggly legs. They may have classical nose allergies and go like that and push their nose in the air. They may ah, make funny little throaty sounds or clucky sounds, which incidentally uh, frequently signifies they might have a milk allergy. This is the way, and they have dark eye circles and bags under their eyes and wrinkles under their eyes. These are clues that there may be more there than just AD, ADD. Now the next thing is, how do they act? Well, many of these children who have ADD, of course, are impulsive. They can't concentrate and they tend to be easily distracted. That's basically what ADD is. But all of those characteristics can be caused 
by exposures to dust, to pollen, to molds, to foods, to chemicals. And the question that you have to figure out is, does my child have this ADD or ADHD, or does my child have a, a, a sensitivity to something in the environment or something they're eating that maybe if I could find out what it is and get rid of it, they'd stop having problems? One of the main symptoms of ADD is a very uh, short uh, attention span. These children cannot pay attention for more than a brief period of second to a particular subject. So they are jumping from one area to, uh, to the other. And uh, so these children become disruptive, uh, inattentive, unable to concentrate, unable to uh, capture the, the, uh, the message mainly for the teacher or for the parents. The major foods that cause problems are generally thought to be red food coloring and sugar. But it can be a whole gamut of foods. For example, it can be milk and dairy products. And you can tell if it's milk or dairy products if you absolutely love milk or hate milk. Or if you hate milk and love cheese and, and ice cream, watch out, you're probably sensitive to milk. And it may not cause hyperactivity, might cause chronic ear infections and bedwetting, but it certainly can cause behavior and learning problems. Second thing is wheat, which is bread and cake and cookies, eggs, uh, chocolate, um, corn, corn flakes, uh, corn products, popcorn, for example. Even the smell of popcorn can do it. Dyes, preservatives, and some of the juices can cause problems, particularly apple, orange, grape, and pineapple. And the juices in milk, incidentally, can also cause bedwetting at night after the age of five years. And the answer, again, is not to give your child an electric shock in the middle of the night when he wets the bed, but find out what he's eating at bedtime or what he's drinking at bedtime and see if that's what's causing the bladder to go into spasm. In other words, some things that you eat make your lungs go into spasm so you have asthma, but other things will cause your bladder to go into spasm, which will cause you to wet the bed. Or in adults, it'll cause the blood vessels to go into spasm and raise your blood pressure, or increase your pulse. So there are different things. It's, it's sort of potluck which area of the body is affected. But almost any area can be affected, in my mind, by almost anything. And it's potluck whether you're going to develop asthma or hay fever or behavior or learning problems in relation to various and sundry exposures. The correction for the children with attention deficit disorder traditionally has been uh, to offer a, uh, a mood modif modifying drugs called Ritalin. As with the six million children that are prescribed and are given Ritalin on a daily basis, or I find and I believe that maybe 10% of the children really need to be put on Ritalin as a short-term basis. Ritalin is a class two narcotic. It's now used as a common street drug. Should we be recommending a class two narcotic to a child when three to seven days on an allergy-free diet might clear up the problem? Should we be recommending that when homeopathic treatment might resolve the problem? Should we be recommending that when certain nutrients might eliminate the problem? In other words, you don't use a, a, a nuclear bomb when you need a fly swatter. I do believe that if we pay attention to the cause of the condition that can rest on the digestive system uh, by paying attention to the diet, uh, eliminating mainly wheat, and, and sugar, uh, preservative, uh, colorants, and giving children what they truly need, which are nutrients of which they may be deficient, uh, mainly trace minerals, enzymes, and some children might also benefit if we will be able to uh, balance the flora in the digestive system and, and improving the uh, toxicity pathway of the liver, because these children are highly, highly toxic. And I have not seen a single child with attention deficit disorder who may not be uh, having problem with heavy metal toxicity, such as lead, aluminum, cadmium, and therefore they become uh, deficient on the precious trace mineral. One of the best recipes that we have found, and it's a very inexpensive route to go, is to use a tablespoon of flaxseed oil and or seed, a tablespoon of lecithin, 
and a tablespoon of nutritional yeast. All three of these combined make an excellent neurotransmitter solution that will help affect the brain and will help bring back the children to what I call a healthy modification. This can be done very simply, either on their cereal or on their salad dressing throughout the day. In conventional medicine, we really look at dealing with symptoms. We do disease care. When symptoms present, we try and get rid of them. You know, in a more natural approach to medicine, we un try and understand why do I experience the symptom that I'm experiencing. Uh, it, I practice what I call integrated medicine, which means that I, I don't have only one system that I use, that I look at people's whole lives. I look at their diet, I look at their emotional state, their stress level, and their, and their medical story. How does one remodulate this immune system out of balance? Well, it happens that we're lucky because the same building blocks that will help an underactive or lowered immune state will also rebalance the overactive immune system. And this is a very basic concept of uh, all immunology and is poorly understood even by many nutritional physicians. We have the building blocks available and we are very well uh, aware of those specific nutrients that are immune related but we in general do not uh, introduce them into the allergy situation. Dr. James Bradley has a unique approach, a more holistic approach to allergens. My experience working with thousands of allergic patients over a period of 15 years, and by the way also at the same time having five uh, clinical nutritionists on staff full time working with the patients, I found that we could reverse allergy whether it was airborne allergy, chemical sensitivity, or food allergy. And often all we did, in fact, consistently what we did was uh, improve their nutritional status, improve the way they ate foods, the way they approached living, uh, got rid of toxins, uh, improved uh, the intake of, 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 of organic foods, uh, taught them the importance of drinking pure water and exercising and dealing with stress and so forth. And by making them healthier, by improving the nutrients they took in, both in the foods and supplements, we were actually seeing a reversal of allergy, where people could be re-exposed to chemicals, be re-exposed to pollens, be re-exposed to foods that formerly they were allergic to, but now without an allergic response. So nutrition plays a critical role, I believe, in both the onset of, of food allergy and also its reversal. The building blocks of the immune system are very well known. There is an enormous amount of peer-reviewed literature which shows those specific nutrients that have to do with immune function. We have a very fundamental list that is vitamin A, vitamin C, the bioflavonoid complex which is related to vitamin C, vitamin E, the oil called GLA or gamma linolenic acid, the oil called EFA or essential fatty acids, and two minerals, zinc and selenium. These are well researched, but unfortunately very few allergists use these in day-to-day -day practice, although they may be treating allergy via direct injections and other medications, other direct treatments, but they in general will not put the immune system back into balance. And the saga continues more next week when we wrap up our series on allergies and natural approach. I'm Gary Knoll. Stay healthy and stay well, and see you next week.